Good evening, Hill family. It's good to see everyone. We have made it to the final uh, lesson in Philippians. Thank you guys for uh, continuing on and pushing through this sermon series. I know this is not the ideal J term, not the ideal 2020, but here we are. Bible's open, Christ still being honored and glorified and faithful in our lives. So we're going to press on tonight. And we come really to the end of this series uh, that we're calling Side by Side for the Gospel. Uh, my hope and prayer over these last few months has been for us to really uh, think a bit deeper about uh, what it means to be the church, about what it means, as Paul says in chapter 1, verse 27, to strive side by side for the faith of the gospel. And as Paul, uh, as he opened, we're going to close the letter tonight, and as he does, he, he really puts his period on this letter by coming back to this idea of partnership. That we began with. Now, throughout our study, we have we have seen how partnership in the gospel requires us sharing uh, a, a specific outlook on life and death. We looked at that back in chapter one. We talked about this idea of partnership or fellowship in the gospel requiring a specific outlook on life and death. We talked about gospel partnership demanding unity in the body, uh, and this unity that we talked about it requires us sharing. A specific mind of Christ, which is rooted in this humility of Christ, seen in the cross. And we talked about partnering together, looks like us uh, together working out our salvation with fear and trembling. We talked about it demands us doing all things without grumbling and complaining and putting the interests of others before ourselves. We saw examples of this in both Timothy and Epaphroditus. And then in chapter 3, we wrestled with this idea that partnering in the gospel demands us knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection, which forces us really, as we see in the text, to press on to maturity in the faith as we live out our, our heavenly citizenship and, and we really embrace the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. So this is what uh, it looks like to be the church, to strive side by side, to partner, to share in this fellowship of the gospel together. Now, as we know, Paul, Paul writes from prison where the Philippians had sent a financial gift to him by way of Epaphroditus, we said, as a sign of, of their love and their, yes, partnership in the gospel. And in response, Paul, he sent back this letter we have been studying to encourage the church and express his love and partnership as well with them. So as we opened up our study with this idea of partnership, we now close it this way as well. In these final verses, <clears throat> we come to what uh, I'm calling Paul's final principles of gospel partnership. So we want to bring this idea home tonight with four principles on what does it look like to be the church? What does it look like to share in this gospel partnership, this gospel fellowship together? The first one is this. <clears throat> Principle number one is that we should show gratitude and we should trust God's providence. As we have seen in so many places in this letter, Paul begins really here with an outburst of joy. Paul is, is rejoicing, and this time he is greatly rejoicing, verse 10 says. And notice um, what his joy is rooted in, and it's, it's rooted in the, the Philippians' partnership in the gospel, in gospel ministry. He's excited about their renewed support for his ministry. Verse 10, look at it. Because <clears throat> I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You indeed, you, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So extended time had passed since Paul received support from the Philippians. Ten years earlier, he had arrived in Philippi. He had preached the gospel. He had been thrown into prison. And then he was released by way of an earthquake in Acts chapter 16. And Paul labored to see this church established, and he had been financially supported by them in the past, as we see further down in verses 15 through 16. <clears throat> but at some point, their financial support had stopped. And for an extended period of time, there was no financial partnership. And yet, this was fine with Paul. He understood. He, he says he knew it wasn't because they weren't concerned for him. They simply lacked the opportunity, or literally the word is, season or time. But now Paul rejoices in the Lord greatly because of this renewed financial support. So we find something subtle 
but very important here, characteristic of Paul's entire life. Paul possessed a patient confidence in God's sovereign provision over his life. Paul trusted the Lord. He, he knew it was the Lord's season, and he knew it was the Lord's timing for his life in any season. Paul understood all of his life to be in God's hand. He believed, and he knew from experience, God would provide. There was no panic in Paul's heart. He never turned to manipulation. He simply trusted God and believed his providential hand would supply all of his needs. And now he can greatly rejoice in the Lord, for he is full of gratitude for the Philippians' renewed financial gift. Paul's deep gratitude stems from his confidence in God's providential hand over his life. He trusted the Lord that he would provide. And the Lord had done so by way of this dear group of saints. He had labored so significantly for the Philippians. So there's a question here for you. For me. Do we, do you, do I possess this confidence in God's providential care over our lives? Do you believe God will provide for you? Do you trust God's provision for your life? I believe Paul was a man very familiar with the words of his Lord Jesus that we know from Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus says, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. He says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 33. Now notice the order of Jesus' words here, which was reflective in Paul's life. Paul sought first the things of the kingdom. Paul was a man on mission for Christ. And because he sought after the kingdom of God, he knew, he confidently trusted that God would supply all his needs. Let's be honest, we get this backwards often, right? We say, let me first get things in order. And then when I do, I will seek the things of the kingdom. Let me work things out and make sure I have some bandwidth in my life and have some financial security and some stability, and then I will seek the things of the kingdom. Yet this does nothing less than demonstrate our lack of trust in God's provision. You see, your trust or my trust or my lack thereof says something about our belief in in God. Paul's life spoke of a confident belief in a sovereign, loving, good God who supplied all of his needs. Whereas Jesus says, a heavenly father. What does our life speak of, church? What does your life speak of? To partner together for the gospel, to strive side by side together, we must be a grateful people who trust God's providence over our lives. So principle number one of gospel partnership is showing gratitude and trusting God's provision. But principle number two is that we should learn contentment through reliance upon Christ. Let me pick up reading again in verse 11. Read down to verse 13. <clears throat> Paul says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and how to, be, how to bound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and uh, plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Confronted here with this important topic of Christian contentment, Paul is no poor beggar. While Paul is grateful for the Philippians' financial partnership, it in no way dictates his joy. Jesus is the source of Paul's joy and strength. And contentment is an essential component to living as God's people. But sadly, most people, we know most people don't experience this. We live in a world characterized by discontentment. And we have churches full of discontent people. Yet Paul was a content man. He was satisfied in prison. Paul was sustained in his chains. Paul was full in his trials. Whatever situation Paul found himself in, whether he had plenty or he was lacking, he was a man who was content. 
So the question becomes, what is contentment? In our culture, contentment is defined as self-sufficiency. This is how you most often hear of it. It's self-sustaining and self-reliance. It's independence. Yet biblically, contentment is something much different. As one author says, biblical contentment is not self-sufficiency, it's Christ-sufficiency, as we see in verse 13. Biblical contentment is believing and embracing the reality that Jesus Christ is enough, period. And Paul says, notice he says here, he learned this. He learned to be content. What that tells us is contentment is not something natural to us as sinners. Contentment is not something that happens overnight. It doesn't happen by osmosis. It must be learned. But how, do, how is it learned? How was it learned for Paul? It was learned through hardship. It was learned through lack. It was learned through difficulty and chains. It was learned through a life of surrender. Through success and failure, through the ups and downs, through lack and plenty, through imprisonment and hardship, through trials and chains, Paul had learned that Christ is enough. And he lets us in on this secret in verse 13. Secret is that Christian contentment is rooted in our union and reliance upon Christ. Paul says boldly, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, this verse is probably one of the most often quoted and, and sadly mis interpreted passages in the Bible. Paul is not speaking categorically or comprehensively here. If so, if Paul could do everything in Christ, then why the heck is he still in prison here? Also, uh, I personally wish that, still do, wish that I could dunk a basketball. But my inability to do so has nothing to do with my unbelief. It has everything to do with my stature, my size, my inability. This phrase, all things, must be governed by the context which is about contentment and material possessions. In other words, difficult circumstances had forced Paul to come to the end of himself and embrace his weakness. And this state of weakness forced Paul to reliance upon Christ, which is where he found contentment. The secret is... Christ is enough, period. That's it. Forget about circumstances. Forget about your perception of success and winning. Forget about growth in ministry and success in ministry. Contentment is not found in any of these. Contentment is found in the fact that Christ Jesus is enough. The question is, do we believe that? Do we know that? Are you content in Christ Jesus? In any situation, here's a question for us today. With all we have going on, the middle of COVID, the middle of social, political, racial tensions in our culture, the polarizing nature of our, of our, of our society, we turn on the news, and no matter what station you look at, it can be depressing. The question is, where are you going to find contentment? Do you see Christ as the, as the all-surpassing one? Do you see him as the all-surpassing worth that he is? As Paul did back in chapter 3. The secret to Christian contentment is its surrender, its weakness. It's not self-sufficiency. It's the rejection of self-reliance. Contentment is embracing the fact that you need Christ. Christ empowers us to find contentment in Him through our weakness, through our failures, through our surrender. Contentment is found in surrendering. Surrendering yourself to embrace full reliance upon Christ. One pastor says it this way, Paul learned the secret because he learned to give attention to the Savior. We learn contentment when we focus on Jesus. We rely upon Him. So are you preoccupied with your with the current circumstances, or are you preoccupied with your Savior? The secret to contentment in the midst of any circumstance is focusing on Jesus and communing with Him. Find your strength in your union with Christ. 
So as we reflect upon this, as, as I think about this, there's a, there's a danger here for us. Because we must be careful about living our Christian life by the avoidance of all difficult situations, because we do that. Difficult situations, as hard as they are, though, they, they do cause us to challenge self-reliance, which is a good thing. Difficult situations force us to come to the end of ourselves. They force us to our, our weakness, which is the place where we find strength, where we find reliance and commitment to Christ. So we need to be honest and confess our tendency to live our lives and parent our kids and lead our homes and, yes, lead this church through the avoidance of difficult situations. Comfort, comfort, comfort is what we seek often. We want to be liked. We want to be applauded. We don't want difficult conversations. We don't want to have conflict. This is our culture, right? We want the best church, the best schools, the best house, the best neighborhood, the best cars, the best, the best, the best, the best, the the easiest, and the easiest, safest things. And these things aren't necessarily bad. But these things can, if we're not careful, adopting this pattern of always seeking comfort in the Christian life, if we do so, it causes us to be self-sufficient, to be self-reliant. If our walk with Jesus is based upon always choosing what is least difficult, are we going to really learn reliance upon Christ? Are we really going to learn what true contentment is? Are we really going to be able to come to the end of ourselves and our weakness and lean into Christ and have to trust in Him? So are we living our Christian life by way of self-sufficiency and self-reliance or independence in finding true contentment in Christ. So I think we often do ask the wrong question in the Christian life. We ask the question, what is the least difficult thing for me, my family, and my walk with Jesus to do? When the question needs to be, God, what are you calling me to? What are you asking me to do? Paul learned contentment. How did he do this? He learned it through difficult situations that he could not do it on his own. He was forced to embrace his inability and weakness, and by so doing, he was forced to rely upon Christ and to find strength there. And by so doing, he learned true contentment. So our second principle for gospel partnership is to learn contentment through reliance upon Christ. And, but the third one is this, that we are to b- become a partner and seek real fruit. So become a partner and seek real fruit. Verse 14. Yes, it was kind of you, yet it was kind of you to share my troubles. And you Philippians yourself know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit uh, that increases to your credit. As we saw back in Verse 10, the Philippians were concerned for Paul, but their sympathy and concern for Paul went beyond mere sentiments. Look at verse 14. Notice the Philippians, it says in verse 14, shared Uh, Paul's troubles, it says. The verb shared belongs to the string of words Paul used in his letter to highlight this partnership of the Philippians and Paul in their activity of advancing the gospel. 1.5, Paul thanks them because of your partnership, your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. Chapter 2, verse 1, we read about their part participation or sharing in the Spirit. Chapter 3, verse 10, Paul ex- explains his desire to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, that he may share his sufferings and become like him in his death. In other words, the Philippians shared in or participated in Paul's trouble. How? By become partners in the ministry with him. They became partners with him. Their concern led them to partner with him financially to advance the gospel. Here we find the inseparable relationship between financial giving and gospel partnership. As believers, we're not called to be customers of the church. We're called to be collaborators together. Partnership demands sacrifice. And while this certainly is not limited to finances. Financial sacrifice is definitely part of it. 
So partnering, becoming a part of a local church, means you move from being simply a customer to a co-laborer. You're to join in gospel partnership by financially giving. And in verse 17, we see why Paul encourages their giving so strongly. His motive for their giving and, and his receiving was never greed. What's it say it is? It says it was fruit. Paul is after fruit for the Philippians. He says the fruit that increases to your credit. Paul is a pastor's heart. He wanted the Philippian church to bear fruit. He wants them to profit spiritually. Paul told the Philippians that his laboring for their progress and joy in the faith, chapter 1, verse 25. Paul wants progress for them, which involves progress in giving, giving to the mission of the gospel. Sacrificing the things of this world for the things of heaven is essential to gospel partnership. It's essential for fruitful Christian living. Paul understood the eternal importance placed on giving, which he got from the Lord Jesus again. Jesus warned us not to lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. While giving, if we're honest, is, is often a difficult or a uncomfortable, let's just say it that way, topic for pastors, especially young pastors. It, it shouldn't be if we understand it pastorally as Paul does here. A pastor's heart should long for the fruitfulness of his people. As a pastor, I have a responsibility to see that people grow spiritually, which requires us investing eternally, not in the things of this world, in the things of heaven. I want to see faithfulness in every area of your lives, in my life, including financial stewardship. This doesn't mean the church is to, you know, know all the business of a person's salary or a bank account balance, but it's important that we do teach on giving because we are to care for you and because we are to uh, give an account for shepherding this body. So here's an important aspect we have to think about. Stewardship is not just an aspect of the Christian life. We tend to, we talk about stewardship in the Christian life. We usually uh, keep it just in the realm of, of finances, but stewardship is the Christian life. If everything belongs to God, then you own nothing. You're simply a steward of what God has entrusted to you. So your time, your money, your giftings, your experience, your children, grandchildren, your marriage, your singleness, and your very salvation belongs to God. You're simply a steward of what he has graciously allowed you to have. So the question is, what type of steward are we? And also, maybe it should be reiterated, this reality of gospel partnership is essential when addressing giving and financial stewardship. You're called to be generous because of the gospel, because of God's generosity in Christ. And you're called to be generous for the sake of the gospel, because of the gospel and for the sake of the gospel. You're called to give your time, talents, and resources for the sake of reaching a lost and dying world with the gospel. And the same reality is which applies to us as the leadership of the church. I, I say often to our, our staff here at the church, whether we're having meetings, we're talking about website, we're talking about kids, we're talking about preaching, we're talking about just the ordinary structures and what we're doing. I, I try to say the same type of thing, which that we have been, as the staff of this church, entrusted with two things, the gospel the life-changing message of Jesus and people, this community. And the leadership of this church, we're to, we're to be held accountable for what is given to us in light of the gospel. We're to take the gospel and give it to the people God's entrusted to us. So our calling is to be co-laborers, to seek, the, to seek true kingdom fruit. It, for those of you who, who give and have faithfully given sacrificially to the hill, Especially in this season, I, I feel uh, as Paul does here. He says, my heart is wide open for you. If you've been coming for a while and part of us and not yet giving, you need to be challenged. Maybe you should start today. Start this week. Not simply because we desire um, 
to, to grow our building and to, to fund our building and to grow, but because the fruit that increases to your credit, Paul says, you're to give for the advancement of the kingdom. You are to release hold of and make an investment in the things of heaven by way of the things of this earth. Become a partner. Give faithfully. Invest eternally for the sake of the gospel. There's a fourth principle here, though. Give worshipfully and trust God's promise. Give worshipfully and trust God's promise. Verse 18, look at it. I have received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus to our God and Father. Be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with you greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. Verse 18, Paul moves on to Old Testament imagery to further instruct us on giving using the language of sacrifice and worship. And just as the Old Testament sacrifice, he's done this before, made a a, a pleasing aroma which would spile upward. Sacrificial giving likewise pleases God, Paul says. I hope we see this here. Paul places the highest possible value on giving sacrificially. He describes it as a means of pleasing worship to the Lord. What smells do you like? Maybe think for a moment. I love the smell of a of a grill. Smell of a freshly cut grass or baseball fields, fresh coffee, dill pickles I love. Yes, Chick-fil-A. Maybe my wife's perfume. Sacrificial obedience in the form of giving for the gospel, Paul says is a pleasing aroma to God. When we sacrifice of ourselves for the advancement of his kingdom, it's a pleasing aroma to the Lord. This should motivate us to give faithfully. We should give sacrificially because we want to please our God who loves us and gave himself up for us. We give because we want to worship Christ. Now, our giving doesn't score us points with God. We know that. We can't earn salvation by giving a check or by giving of our time and talents. No, we give because of what he has given us. We give in light of as a response to what he's done for us in Christ. Our giving is an expression of worship. It's an expression of our belief in his worthiness. When we do this, there is a a promise we get to hold firm to. Read it again, verse 19 and 20. It's so good. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever Amen. Since the Philippians supplied Paul's needs, since they gave sacrificially as an act of worship, Paul promises that God will supply all their needs out of his infinite resources in Jesus Christ. We we must note God promises to supply the Philippians' needs here, not their greeds, not their wants. And yes, this includes their financial needs, but it extends to their spiritual needs, their ability to to be content and to find strength in Jesus Christ. Paul says God will provide everything we need to live for Christ. So brothers and sisters, if we are motivated to strive side by side for the gospel, we should marvel at this great promise. If we are committed to sacrificial giving for the sake of the gospel in this community, we must treasure this grand promise in Christ. For us to live and give like the Philippians, we have to believe this promise. God will supply all our needs according to his riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Paul was a man who lived by this promise. It's really all he had at this moment as he wrote this letter from prison. Paul had sacrificed everything. Paul didn't have... uh, you know, land and a home. He didn't have a 401k. He didn't have a retirement strategy here. No matter the situation, Paul found contentment in Christ because he believed this promise. He sacrificed everything for the riches that were be offered him in Christ. So it's, it's true. We all have fears. 
in a myriad of different ways, but when it comes to money and resources and future plans and just what's going to happen over the next few months with coronavirus and all that's going on in our country, in our nation. We have an election coming up. And man, if I can just tell you, it's, it can be wearisome thinking about the election coming up in our country and, and, the, and the possible division that we're going to see and the polarizing comments that are coming out and, and even amongst uh, believers. So there's many fears that are there, but we must fight fear with this promise of God. We fight fear with the gospel. We remember Paul's words back in chapter 3, verse 12, that we press on in the faith to make it our own. Why? Because Christ Jesus has made us his own. In moments of doubt and anxiety, we must fix our eyes upon the cross, remembering that God has already provided our greatest need. He has already poured out his richest blessing on us in Christ. Before Christ, we were all spiritually bankrupt in our sin. We were separated from God in our rebellion and stood opposed to him in our sin. But the gospel tells us that God gave richly of himself by giving us his one and only son, Jesus. So this promise is a good one. It's a grand one. It's one that is a headline for us that should be above our news flashes in our mind every day. It's a glorious promise that can't go away. No leader that can be elected or not elected will bring it about or take it away. Christ has accomplished it. By way of the gospel, we possess the guarantee and the promise of receiving all the riches of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. God has already forgiven our sins, provided us with his righteousness. He's poured out his spirit upon us. He's adopted us into his family. He's given us an eternal hope. Doing all of this, is it even logical to conclude in any way that he will not provide our needs if we live sacrificially for him? So to partner in the gospel, as a gospel church, we must give sacrificially as an act of worship while holding fast to this rich promise of God in Christ. What a way to tie the bow on this letter. Two words I want to leave us here from the book of Philippians. Two glorious treasure words that we pull out of God's chest here. Glory and grace. Everything we do together as the body, our partnership as a local church, our fellowship as the body, it must have an aim to it. All of our prayers, all of our laboring, everything must have an aim to it. We must be able to look at the news and see what's going on in our society and know that there is an aim to it. All things are moving for the fame and the glory of our God. Paul has sprinkled this throughout the letter. Go back and look at them all. Chapter 1, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 11. Chapter 3, verse 3. And now he closes. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. We partner together for the glory of God. Simple as that. It's about him. Not about you. Not about me. Not about us. About him. His fame. His name. His glory. We give sacrificial to advance his great name in this world. And how do we do this? Our second word here, grace. As he says in verse 22, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is grace? It's the gospel. We deserve death and punishment for sin. We receive grace, love, forgiveness, kindness, mercy. We receive a savior. We receive forgiveness and eternal life. So church, We strive side by side for the gospel to the advancement of God's glory by being a gospel people and proclaiming the good news of God's grace to the world. This is our mission statement here at the Hill. We exist to glorify God by declaring the grace of God. What is that? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Through our lives together, this partnership, this sharing, this fellowship, this koinonia, we partner together. We lock arms and we strive side by side for the gospel. So, brothers and sisters, we're going to stop here, and I'm going to. You're going to have some questions to go through, but I really want you tonight to yes, 
use these final verses in chapter 4 to dig deeper, but use them as a launch pad to go back and really think through the book together. What does it look like to strive side by side for the gospel? We're grateful for you, grateful for this series. Uh, We look forward to seeing you at 6.30 as we worship uh, at the Hill on Sundays for the foreseeable future. That's what we'll be doing. We'll give you updates. I'm not going to give you an exact date because it could change. We want to trust the Lord. We want to invite you to be there. And, And know this, that even in our rhythms as a church in this season, it's difficult uh, maybe on Sunday mornings, or uh, it's different for your family. But know this, especially if you're a member of our church, your participation in our gatherings and corporate events as a church is for you, for your spiritual growth, but it's not just for you. It's for other people in our church. Uh, your partnership, your sharing in the life of the body is about other people. So your participation is needed, you're needed, and we look forward to seeing you. So Jump into your questions tonight. Let me pray for us. And I pray your time will be fruitful as you go back through this book. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you saved us. You've worked on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, that we share in life with one another because we share in life with you solely because of what you've done for us in Christ. So, Lord, as we put an end to this series, there's many people in community groups and many Uh, different places spiritually. Lord, if anyone's been visiting a community group or coming and they're hearing my words and watching these videos and they don't know you, uh, they're recognizing that what they thought, what it meant to be a Christian, there's something more to it that they're missing. They'd reach out to their leader or other people in their group. And Lord, that we might be able to explain the riches of the gospel and help us not to go through a book of Philippians like this and someone miss the life-changing, transforming power of the gospel. So Lord, I, I pray for mercy and grace upon them even in this time. And Lord, be with our discussion tonight. Help us to root all things in Christ and to grow and be transformed into him. In Jesus' name, amen.